Hi, welcome to Learning Across Kansas. I'm Cindy Couchman and I'm your host for this episode. Learning Across Kansas is a joint partnership between the Kansas State Department of Education and the Kansas Public Broadcasting Service. Together we want to ensure education continues as we face social distancing and health and safety issues in our society right now. As you can see, I'm hosting outside. That's because April 22nd is our 50th celebration of Earth Day. We're gonna take Cross Kansas to seven different teachers and they're gonna talk about how math, science, social studies, English, and even your social emotional health all connect to our beautiful Earth. We're gonna start in DeSoto, Kansas with Kyle Heilman, who's gonna share a little bit about how Native Americans really treasured and valued the Earth and used every single resource available to them. Kyle, take it away. My name is Kyle Heilman. I teach history and archeology span for the DeSoto School District. I will tell you that Earth Day holds a special meaning in my heart, especially for 2020 as the 50th anniversary. But I'm also fascinated that Native Americans had a love of the Earth as well for thousands of years. The best archeological evidence tells us they have lived in North America for 16,000 years. Most Native American tribes had no idea of land ownership some of them often referred to the land as belonging to their grandchildren, the idea that it should be passed on and protected. They not only worshiped the land, they prayed for everything the land gave them. And that's the irony of it. The land gave them everything. Everything you see in front of you are pieces of artifacts from Native American campsites in Kansas, things they traded for and lived with off the land, whether it's a deer school, or a deer antler, or even a bison horn, or seashells traded through a seashell network, or pottery made out of clay. The Native Americans used everything around them. The long white bead was carved from a rib bone. The tiny brown bead was carved from a bison horn. They literally wasted nothing. After an animal had been processed and the hide turned into skin, the fur used for pillows and boots and coats, they literally would take the extra bones and make a bone pile outside of the campsite so that any family, any person could find something there to use. Waste was not an option. When you see a bison, it's a beautiful animal and large and terrifying. They saw Walmart on feet. It was everything they needed to live with. So when we celebrate Earth Day this year and we consider all of our options as Kansans, I ask you to remember that there were people for here for thousands of years, literally using everything around them, living with the earth, not just on it. And of course, as pioneers arrived, choices changed, manifest destiny, the idea that they were supposed to come and conquer and change and build, changed how we saw the earth. Now you're gonna meet a wonderful woman named Kara Ballou, who's gonna to talk to you about changes through time. Thank you for your attention and time. Rachel Carson publishes Silent Spring. It launches a huge conversation about the environmental movement and the debate that we have going on on the climate today. What was it like when Rachel Carson's book came out, Silent Spring? It was re very revolutionary and increased the awareness of everybody about what was going on with the environment. So another thing that kind of caught everybody by surprise was in 1969. Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, Ohio caught fire because it was so polluted. So Senator Nelson from Wisconsin said, we're gonna do Earth Day, April 22nd, 1970, and 22 million people show up to celebrate Earth Day. This is going to lead to legislation like the Environmental Protection Act, Clean Water and Clean Air Act, Endangered Species. So let's talk about one more thing and go into a little bit of economics. So people respond to awareness. Well, they also respond to economic incentives. So in 1973, the United States supported Israel in the Yom Kippur War, which caused the Arab nations to embargo oil into the United States. Let's see what that did to America's car industry. When we're talking about Earth Day today, there was an embargo of oil in the early 70s also. What kind of an impact did that have? It created long lines at the service stations to put in fuel, and the fuel prices went up from about 
39, 40 cents a gallon to over a dollar a gallon. What did that do to cars? It changed them from the big V8 engines that got eight, nine miles to the gallon to the small economy cars that were getting 30, 35 miles to the gallon. One thing was the Cadillac converters that they put on cars to cut down on that. They changed it to unleaded fuel, took the lid out. Uh, they went from carburation to fuel injection, which gave better mileage. They cut the weight on the cars from big steel frames and steel cars to basically lightweight metal. And now I'd like to thank my parents for their help in showing us how people and things change over time using a little history on Earth Day and their 1960 Chevy Impala bubble top. Now back to Cindy Couchman. Kansas school buildings may be closed for the remainder of the academic year, but school is still in session. Keeping students engaged in the learning process during this extraordinary time is critical for their ongoing success. We salute our teachers, parents, and guardians who are committed to ensuring their students finish this year strong. We're all ready for our lives to get back to normal, but until that time, Kansas students, keep learning and keep working towards your goals. Together, Kansans can. Thank you, Kyle and Kara. From learning how Native Americans really valued the land and used every resource to its fullest potential, to how Earth Day has influenced legislation and continues to protect our Earth, even through the cars we drive. We're gonna kick it back to Kyle Heilman at DeSoto to now learn about fossil fuels. Kyle, take it away. Hello, my name is Kyle Heilman. I teach history and archeology span for DeSoto Unified School Districts. I'm here to talk to you about Kansas history and fossil fuels. We hear about fossil fuels all the time during Earth Day. People have concerns about pollution, but where did it all start? Where did it come from? About 100 million years ago, Kansas was part of an inner ocean of warm, salty water and had amazing life forms and dinosaurs swimming through it. You and I would not want to swim with them. We wouldn't last long, but beautiful creatures. Now, if you have a fish tank and you've seen what settles at the bottom of your fish tank, fish, food, remnants, plants, that is exactly what limestone is made up of for Kansas. We are the bottom of a prehistoric ocean. And all of that biological material rotted and processed and literally created oil, coal, and natural gas, hence the title fossil fuels. Before you, you see several fossil samples from my museum, a trilobite, megalodon shark's tooth, a teenage megalodon shark's tooth. You also see a prehistoric bison tooth, a prehistoric horse tooth, an angel wing, remnants, um, ammonites, beautiful prehistoric squid shells, a bison leg bone, a woolly mammoth tooth, and a mastodon tooth, and even a prehistoric fish. Kansas is literally filled with fossils. If you go out hunting for fossils, you simply need to look where they have cut the road through the hill, and you'll see all the layers of limestone, an old screwdriver, and a hammer or a hammer and a chisel with parents' permission, and you can seek out little pieces of history and chisel them out. This is a petrified fern, and because it sticks up, that's the actual fern in the rock that's petrified, turned to stone. If you look carefully, you'll find little fragments like this with hundreds of thousands of petrified fossils in them. And if you're lucky, you might even find a sedimentary layer from the bottom of the prehistoric ocean. Fossil fuels are great. They worked fantastic for us for almost 200 years, but they do produce CO2. And you're about to meet an amazing teacher named Cheriel de la Cruz, and she's gonna to talk to you about CO2 and mathematics. Have a great day. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you, Kyle. This is Cheriel de la Cruz from 50 Wonderful District, Topeka Public Schools. Atmospheric carbon dioxide, or CO2, has been dominating other greenhouse gases in the last century. And why is that? Because of the drastic increase of CO2 emissions. Our use of fuels, coals and oils, the so-called fossil fuels. Let's take a look at this graph of atmospheric CO2 levels measured at NOAA's Mauna Loa Observatory, Hawaii, in recent years. If we take annual data from 2007 to 2019, 
it can be modeled by a linear regression, y equals 2.35x plus 381.8, where x is in years and y is the amount of atmospheric CO2. This means that the CO2 is increasing by 2.35 ppms every year. Now use this equation to predict this year's amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. I'm pretty sure you can do the math. So now what? Well, scientists believe that our climate is changing at a faster rate because of this drastic increase of CO2. And it has multiple impacts across the Earth. Sea level rise and longer, loss of sea ice, change in precipitation pattern, and more intense heat waves. And of course, many more. From this NASA's GISS graph, it can be observed that temperature changes over the years from 1880 to the present. How is it changing? The U.S. National Climate Assessment Climate Central put these two together in one graph. Looks like both temperature and carbon dioxide follow the same curve. What else do you notice? And what do you wonder? Based on the graph, do you think climate change is largely caused by the world's use of fossil fuels? This year's Earth Day theme is climate action. Climate change is one of the challenges that Earth is facing right now, and there's so much that we can do to make this planet a better place to live. This world needs us. This world needs our action. We're experiencing a public health crisis like we've never seen before. COVID-19 is here in Kansas, in our bigger cities and our smaller towns alike. There are several things you can do to protect those around you. First and foremost, please stay home, leaving only when you need food or medicine or to get some exercise. Practice social distancing. Please trust that we'll get back to normal far more quickly if we band together as Kansans. Wow, those are some amazing fossils, Kyle. Thank you for sharing them with us. And learning about carbon monoxide into our environment, that's really impactful. It makes me want to go buy an electric car. So learning from about fossil fuels and the energy that they produce to the energy that the sun produces. We're gonna go learn about solar panels with Stan Burkamp in Mays, Kansas. Hi, my name is Stan Burkamp. I teach physics and chemistry at Mays High School. So I'm standing in front of a 720 panel, 200 kilowatt solar array, which the construction started this on Earth Day 2019, April 22nd. And so it's kind of fitting that as we develop this theme of Earth Day and the idea of using renewable energy, that I do this presentation here. So how the system works is fairly simple. We have our local star, otherwise known as the sun, and that works on a fusion process where hydrogen slams together in a very high pressure situation and forms helium. Out of that process, we get little bundles of energy called photons. So those photons leave the surface of the sun. It takes them about eight minutes to get here. And when they strike the surface of the solar array, the solar array is constructed so that these little bits of matter that we call photons or electrons are hit by the photons and the electrons become excited and they actually leave that stable state. So what the solar array does is that it takes those electrons that have been excited and generates an electric current. So that electric current is what we call direct current or DC. So before we can use it on the grid, what we have to do over here is that this bank of equipment here changes those that direct current into alternating current or AC. So then once that AC current is generated, then that gets dumped out on the grid and then we can use it. So we have sunlight coming in, striking the electrons, the electrons become excited. We change the DC into AC. At the end of the day, as any good electrical story goes, we can make toast. So we, ge we generate that electricity right here and we use it just over there at the school. So plants have been doing this for years and now I'm going to turn this over to Shannon and she's going to explain how plants take those photons and build 
sugars out of that. Take it away, Shannon. Hey, thanks, Stan. You're right, leaves are a whole bunch like your solar panels. Their job is to do the same thing, really, and that is convert energy from the sun into energy in the form of glucose that can be used by the plant and also by really every living thing on our planet. So here's how that works. Leaves are really cool in that they have organelles in them that are called chloroplasts. If you take a chloroplast and you cut it open this way, it looks sort of like this. Inside of the chloroplast are these disc-like things. They're actually little membranous discs and they have pigments in them. Pigments do the same thing that your solar panels do. Their job is to catch the photons. I like to think of it kind of like a catcher's mitt. So if you have a catcher's mitt like this, you catch the ball, right? Well, uh, what happens in pigments is particularly chlorophyll, which is the green one, it has an electron in the dead center of the molecule. And it, that electron is able to move. So what happens is when a photon comes in, the electron gets excited, just like that. We don't want the electron to fall back down or the plant doesn't. So what it does instead is it captures that energy and it uses it to make energy carrying compounds. The names of them aren't that important, but their function is. Because then what happens is those compounds are gonna be used, that energy is gonna be used to put carbons together. So another way to think about it is think about a welder. A welder is trying to fuse two things together and it doesn't happen without energy, right? It has a torch <clears throat> like that that fuses things together. Well, plants do really a similar thing. The difference is they're pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, right? So the CO2 is out in the atmosphere and they need, those carbons need to be fused together, but it doesn't happen without energy. So the energy carrying compounds <clears throat> fuse those two things together, right? And it happens over and over until ultimately you build glucose, which is C6H12O6. So those six carbons really ultimately came from CO2 in the atmosphere. Now this energy can be used by critters eating the glucose and it starts almost every food chain on our planet. Yay, glucose, that's why this is a big deal. You're going to learn how to use that from Heidi here in a minute, but right now we're going to toss it back to Cindy. Hey parents, you're doing great. With Kansas school buildings closed and homes being turned into classrooms, parents and caregivers have expanded their roles in their students' learning. This is a new experience for most of us, so let's show one another a little grace. When you and your students start to feel overwhelmed or stressed, take a break. It's really okay. Keeping students interested and engaged in learning is the key to success. Remember, you have an entire community of fellow caregivers and teachers to lean on. Reach out. Together, Kansans can. We learned from Stan Burkamp and Shannon Ralph how the energy that the sun produces can be captured in solar panels in the same way that we capture it to produce glucose in plants. Next, we're going to go to Heidi Alban in Mays, who talks about that same energy from the sun and what it does in our social emotional well-being and the importance of being outside. Heidi, it's off to you. I'm Heidi Albin with Complete High School Mays in Mays, Kansas. Happy Earth Day. Earth Day is a great way to get outside. Did you know that being outdoors is actually important to your mental and emotional health? That's right. It's so important that not being outside can lead to nature deficit disorder, which refers to the damage that can occur socially and mentally and emotionally and physically when we don't spend enough time outdoors. A quick internet search for scholarly articles will reveal to you the many scientific studies that have indicated that a lack of spending time outdoors can correlate with rises in obesity, diabetes, anxiety, and a stunting of social growth, depression, and even delayed cognitive development. So let's get outside. A great way to get outside and to be productive is to take advantage of the sun providing energy through photosynthesis by starting a garden. And gardening is easier than you think. Hi, I'm John with Sinagro Gardens Education. I wanted to bring you into my hoop house today to see my garden and how well plants can grow with just seeds, sunshine, compost, and water. There is nothing else added to these gardens. 
You know, growing your own food can not only be very physically healthy because you're enjoying the wonderful nutrient-dense produce that can be had by sunshine, water, and compost, but it's also very therapeutic. So please visit sinagrogarden.com for lots of resources that are free of charge. And please, please get out and enjoy Earth. No matter if it's gardening, hiking, camping, or fishing, being together and having new experiences outside can draw uh, people closer to each other. Thank you so much for watching with us today. We're going to send it over to Sam Neal in Bueller, Kansas now. Hi, my name's Sam Neal and I teach high school English at Bueller High School in Bueller, Kansas. And I love how easy it is to garden. I also love how easy it is to get creative and start writing. So I'm going to share a technique with you today and you're only going to need three simple things to do it. Let's get started. The three things that you're going to need to start your roll die poetry are a notebook or a piece of paper, something to write with, and a die from one of the games in your house. The final thing you're going to need is some inspiration. So I took some pictures around my neighborhood and that, that inspired me to start writing. What you need to do is label each line 1 to 10 on a piece of paper. These become your lines of poetry. Then you're going to roll a die. Every time you roll this die, that becomes the number of words that you get to use in that line of poetry. So you're going to do this 10 different times. It's okay if when you're writing, you make mistakes. Writing takes a lot of drafts. So I'm going to show you what my first draft looked like, and then I'll share my poem with you at the end. This picture of a Bradford pear and a red bud and a lone bench by the pond really inspired me. This is how my draft looked from when I started until I got it the way that I wanted to. Remember, it doesn't have to be perfect. Poetry is powerful because of the words that are used. We want active words. We want personification where we have inanimate objects that are able to do human tasks. We also want to focus on those adjectives and adverbs that really bring our writing to life. It's okay to go back and revise after you've written your first draft. Don't be scared to take chances with your writing. And now I want to share one of my poems with you. A lone wooden bench sits near a calm pond, surrounded by friends, the white Bradford pear, the pink redbud tree. This bench has waited all winter, counting the days until spring arrived. And now, warm sun wakes the earth from its slumber. Get outside, get writing. It's so simple to get creative. Thank you, Sam. Being outside and finding a creative outlet is so important for our social emotional well being. I want to thank the seven teachers that have connected Earth Day to their content areas. And a special shout out to educators all over the state of Kansas who have made learning a continuum priority. Thank you to the Kansas State Department of Education and the Kansas Public Broadcasting Service for making this partnership possible. I'm Cindy Couchman. Thank you for joining us.